So what I wanted to talk about today was the process of writing an offer. And um, let me make this a little smaller. There's going to be a series of parts to this. Um, right now, what I wanted to talk about in the first session is how to get your system set up and to begin the process of writing an offer. Um, I start with the make your life easy slide. It is showing up on the screen, isn't it? Um, and uh, whether or not you want to write this down or if you just send me an email, I'll send you this list. But my list for ways in which you can make your life a lot easier if you're writing offers is, one, to use a cover sheet. And I'm going to show you how to do that when we um, get started. Here, let me do that. And we get into the actual forms it's, itself. The other one is to use templates. And there's a buyer template and a seller template. And you might have, as you become more experienced, other templates like, for example, if the property's in a trust, the forms are different. There's some differences, right? A probate would be some differences. Commercial would be differences. And right now we're just talking about buyers and sellers. And I, I threw in trust. Why not? Um, MLS Connect is something that I've talked about before that allows you to import information from the multiple listing service actually into the form itself so it saves you a lot of typing. And RPR, the Realtor Property Resource, has recently added a link in RPR to zip forms. And we're going to actually look at that. And the reason why this is a big deal is number one for listings. So if I'm on a listing appointment, I don't necessarily have an MLS number that I could import all the information from because you're thinking about putting it on the MLS. So there's no MLS record that I can import from, but there is. Thank you, Jamal. You're hired. I was waiting, but he's fixing up. It's, yeah, yeah. Don't fight. Don't fight. There's enough copies for everybody. So to do a listing, what we can do is we can pull it up in RPR, the property, and it will import the information directly into zip forms. Also, this is important if you're going to write an offer on a property that's not in our MLS. Let me give you an example, Fremont. I help agents often with offers in Fremont. Fremont is not part of our MLS. Now, we have reciprocal access to the MLS that Fremont is in, but it's not the same. We can't use MLS Connect in Fremont, right, because it's out of our MLS but we can use RPR, which means RPR will pull up all the listings for sale just about anywhere, and it'll pull the data from that listing into zip forms, right? So these are the big things, right? And we're, what I want to do is sort of go through this process, and we're going to do something fun, and the fun thing, I guess this will be fun, is we're actually going to do a, a sample on a non-MLS listing. Doesn't that sound like fun? And one way in which we would do that is when you log into the MLS, and I realize that some of the people watching this are from my Santa Rosa contingent, and they their MLS looks different, but they still have access to RPR, the Realtor Property Records. And I thought for fun we would do that. And notice the box that pops up is a properties for sale box. One of the things that RPR seems to be doing is migrating more to we're your program for accessing the multiple listing service and your program for doing a lot of other things. So why don't we just type in F-R-E-M-O-N-T, Fremont, California. And basically what this will be doing is pulling up active listings. Notice we can even search for pending. And one of the values, by the way, of doing some searches in RPR is, is that it covers everything that's in that area, no matter what MLS it's in. Anyhow, I'll give you, let's go down. How about 600 Montecito Terrace? It looks like a nice little house. Its price is $7 million. Let me pick something a little more. A little, a little less frightening. All right. How about um, so up here? I could say living area price, no maximum. How about uh, let's see what we have for under nine hundred thousand. 
in Tremont apply The other questions that people often ask me when they're writing an offer is they'll send me a link or an address and they'll say, we're writing an offer on this. What do you think about the price? You know, thanks. You know, so um, I would have to go to the MLS and do all the research as well. But um, the, the process generally is to speak to the listing agent, find out how many offers they have. And that determines the price you're going to offer. Let's look at this first one here, 902000 34504 Colville Place, Fremont, California. Now, I'm only using this just to show this is not in our MLS. And normally, I wouldn't be able to just pull the listing in. Um, but notice one of the choices now is something called Zip Forms Transactions. Does everybody see that? Is it showing up on my screen? Zip Forms Transactions. And I click on that, and this will pop up. It will identify the property, start a new zip forms transaction, or go to my home page. Why not start a new one? And we go to zip forms. And what it's done, it's asking me, uh, it's going to show me a video if I want to watch it. It's actually kind of nice. We're just going to hit continue. And I'm already logged into the zip forms just to make this a little bit easier. But what it's doing is it's creating a transaction. It's creating a transaction, an empty transaction right now, but it's creating a transaction. And if I were to click on cover sheet, which is one of the things I suggest that you use and we open it up, you're going to see, don't see there's the information about the property. Um, the information about the seller uh, and let's see did it pull in the listing agents information now so it's not perfect but it pulls in some of the information and puts it in the system All right just thought I would share that let's go to writing an offer and what we're going to do remember my little list here I talked about a cover sheet I'll talk we're actually going to go in and write an offer but I was going to pick a different property something in our MLS so we can use MLS Connect. So let's go into, um, that's not where I want to be. Wants to show me the video. Here we go. So we're going to go to transactions. I was messing around in templates. We're going to go to transactions and notice that one I clicked on now appears as a transaction. But it works better in our MLS. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just find a house to make an offer on. So why don't we, we're, we're going into matrix. And for purpose of this, you could do any property, but I'm going to do a single family home and the listing office broker code is KWSN. And how about we're going to help out whoever this is. Um, Peralta. Julie, does Julie need help with her listing? So we pulled up Julie's listing. And what you do is while you're looking at it, you click on the MLS numbers. The other things you might want to look at, TD is something that you would have access uh, only if you're a member of another association. I look down here to see if they have any information on um, the documents and things like that. There isn't a documents tab there. So we're copying the MLS number, right? That's pretty much all we're going to do right now. And we're going to go, we're in transactions and zip forms, and we're going to click on new. And what was the address of the property? Let me just, Cheney, all right, 4762 Cheney. So we're just going to call that C-H-E-E-N-E-Y. Um, E-N-E-Y, Cheney. It's a, it's a purchase residential and I have templates all right now the 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 template is something you want to create either by yourself or are we losing you oh you can't do you could move up if you wanted to you could if you just want to watch what's going on and then not everybody here has complete access to all this stuff so I've created a buyer template and I click on save 
And the reason for creating the template is, is that it's already going to put in a lot of, um, more than I really wanted, a lot of documents, but it fills out the cover sheet. And the part that it fills out is my part there. So at the very least, what we want to do is create a template that has all of our information in it for a buyer. The thing you don't want to end up doing is typing this in over and over and over and over again. So I guess what I'm, I'm suggesting is, is that you make a plan for that you're going to be doing this a lot. Right? Aren't you going to be doing this a lot? Right? You're going to want to save time. Right. Even if you're not doing it as much as you would like to be doing it, a lot of times you're under great time pressure to do it. Somebody says, now, now, I want, you know, write an offer list now, and you don't want to have to be manually typing in information that you don't need to manually type in. Right. So we've done that, and that saves us a lot of information to put in. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go over here to the back button. This shows us the desktop, and we're going to go to property. We're going to go to property and MLS connect. And if your ML, if it says your MLS up here, then it's working. If it's not saying it up here, it's not working. And if your MLS is not connected up here under MLS connect, it usually means that you don't have your NRDS number in the MLS uh, under your information. But let's assume that everybody can see this. So I'm going to paste in the MLS number. I include the property photo for fun. And I click on Find. And what it's doing is it's finding the property that I wish to write an offer on. Say so put in a picture of the property, put in all that information. I click on Import and say Yes. And what it's now done is it's imported all of that information. So when I go, I save it, and I go back to Documents, and now when I open up the cover sheet, it has, let's start at the top, Seller's Information. Now in this one, it only says Owner, but notice it has all the MLS information. It's already there, and it's put in the other agent's information as well. Right? So by using a template that has my contact information and then using the MLS Connect that brings in the other agent's contact information, the property information, we now don't have a lot that we have to do, right? Other than, I don't know why there's dot, dot, dots, but we put in buyer, um, Billy Buyer is our buyer, and the only things we really need to put in our, our buyer is their name and their um, email address. When the re we want that in there so that later we can email them documents to sign. And by putting it in there, it's going to let us do that. By the my suggestion is is that when you first meet with somebody and you're writing an offer for the first time, you do it face to face. You actually print out a copy of like this and you sit down and you go through it with them. Over time, that's not going to be necessary, right? There's some people that have made five or six or seven or eight or ten offers, right? The last thing they want to hear is you explain it one more time and then you can just email them the link and they'll sign it, right? But you need to be good at this. I, I tell the story of uh, I sold a house this year to clients that I'd never met. And it was a house I had never seen, right? Because we did everything online and they signed online and I went through it online with them, showing them and explaining the contract. So we want that we don't want to give them, them being the listing agent, the address, phone number, or any other information about the buyer. Email doesn't get populated into the form anywhere, but address does. And there's just no reason to tell the listing agent the address of your buyer, right? A lot of times you don't need it. Webcam closed by organizer. That's me. I don't know why I closed it. People can see me. Oh, no. All right. So does that make sense? The I, By the way, I tend to use this form to write the offer. So let's say the purchase price, um, it's listed at 928 
What what do you think it's worth? Nine times. Nine twenty eight. All right. So you're working for Julie now. I get it. No, we understand. We understand. You become Julie's Julie's pet. So now so the next yeah, that would make her happy probably. So note it says purchase agreement date. That's the date we're writing it. Right, so if we're writing it now, we're going to put the 14th. That doesn't mean it's the date they signed it. It doesn't mean, uh, it doesn't necessarily, offer date is another date. Closing date, we could either pick a date, which I, some of you know, I kind of like because we then at least know what it is. Or you could say 30 days, 21 days, or something like that. Why don't we, I like to pick a date. So let's assume that our lender, and I like to pick a date somewhere in the middle of the week, right, just to give us a little buffer one way or the other in case something needs to be done. 30 days would put us about the 19th of the day or two. Why not? The deposit amount, what's traditional right now is to put down 3% as the initial deposit. Um, 928.123 times 0.03 is $27,800. So we can actually write that in here, 27,840. And we've got the deposit, increased deposit. In the, We'll see if it goes back to this. In the old days when it was not so heavy of a seller's market, buyers typically put down 1% as their initial deposit and then raised it by 2% to a total of 3 when they remove the contingencies. It's just, why not, right? Um, if we were doing that, we would then use this other form called the increased deposit receipt, which we're not, we're not putting any of that in. Offer date, when do we expect our clients to sign this, this jewel? Maybe not till tomorrow, right? I'm writing it today, but they're like, we're gonna look at it tomorrow, we'll come by. So I pick tomorrow, that's the offer date. Expired date is the date that the offer expires. The default setting is for how long? That's right, it's three days. That's right, very good. It's three days. So if you don't change anything, they have three days to accept the offer. Right, that's considered courteous to the listing side, but generally they're not going to need three days to decide if they like your offer or not. Right. All days are calendar days with the exception of the deposit money, which has to be put in in three business days. Right. But it's all days are calendar days. So if I don't change anything here, then it's going to be three days. If we were doing something called a preemptive offer, and a preemptive offer is, let's say, the listing agent said on Tuesday we're going to take offers, but you have somebody that wants to make a high offer right now, that's called a preemptive offer. You just ignore the Tuesday in the MLS and you make an offer. Generally, you'd give people like three or six hours to accept it. Right? You wouldn't let it languish there. Let's just assume we're not changing that. Generally, if you don't have a good reason to change it, don't change it. Amount we don't need to worry about. We can check these boxes. I've had agents call me up. They don't go anywhere. Right? One of the classes, which I might do again if I feel like it, is um, go through this form and mark all the things that actually go someplace. Right? They don't. So the cover sheet, just so you understand, why does it ask me questions about things that aren't necessary for the form? The answer was at one time real estate agents carried away around pieces of paper, and so we would print this out. Right? We would print this out and carry it with us, and it would have information, but but not all of it actually ends up in the form. I picked seller's choice for escrow. Right, it, I don't know, it did. Well, I don't know. Julie's blocked you from knowing that. All right, so let's say I'm uh, in this, whole, anyhow, let's say I'm, I'm, she has, she, she has. Oh, that, that comes from public information. Oh, you mean they're not oh, let me see. Maybe I didn't do it right. Amount financed. That was left over from before. Let me go. Let me go down here. I was going to look at that. I like to do that on the sheet. 
So that was left over from something that was done before. Why don't we just leave that for now? All right. So let's look at our, our, our offer, the residential purchase agreement. And at some point, we're going to practice explaining this to each other. Uh, first thing that I look at when I look at these, and I see them a lot, is I check agency disclosure to see if there's too many boxes checked. There's only one buyer. Sometimes there's no boxes checked. This is the agency disclosure form, which is part of the agreement. Um, so we want one, if there's one buyer, we want one box checked. If there's two buyers, we want two box checked. We want the right box checked. All right. And um, then there's the back of that, the possible representation of more than one buyer and seller. Today, the first two, two times, we're just going to go through the let's fill it out. So you could read that if you wanted to, but basically I just look to make sure it's got everything filled in correctly. This is the purchase agreement. Notice it has 21 days. Maybe that's kind of cutting it short. 21 days is what I picked. How about let's make it 30 uh, after acceptance. Why not? Keller Williams Silicon City and Keller Williams Silicon City, we have to click on the box that says, that we're representing both the buyer and the seller because we're helping Julie by selling her listing. All right. Does everybody understand that? If the other listing looks at Keller Williams Cupertino, <clears throat> then we would not say we're representing both sides because Keller Williams Cupertino is not the same as us. Isn't that right? What do I want to say here? So here's the deposit and cashier's check, personal check, or things you could click on, it doesn't really matter how the money gets into escrow as long as the money gets into escrow within three business days. Notice this says three business days, right? This is the only thing that says business days. Everything else, all days are calendar days. You have three business days, and as long as the money gets into escrow in three business days, Nobody really cares whether or not it was a personal check, a cashier's check, Canadian maple leaves in the sack, right? They really don't care, right? As long as you bring in the money within three business days. So I generally don't worry about all this. Electronic funds transfer is the default, which is the simplest way to do it. The one thing that you do not want to do is you do not want the buyer to write a check for the escrow company and give it to you to hang on to, right? You do not want to hold a check. You don't want to see a check. You don't want to touch a check. You don't want to have a check, right? The law on that is that if uh, you were to be given a check, you're supposed to bring it to the office. You're required to bring it to the office and give it to Opie, right? She'll probably sigh and, at you. When she, and then because she has to find a book and open up the book and write down all the information in a ledger that you have the check and how much the check is and what is the check for and when are you going to, you know, and then give you back the check. Nobody wants to go through all that, right? So you tell your client, you keep your check and you take your check to the escrow company. That way you can meet the escrow officer and all the other people and you'll get a receipt from the escrow company when they give you give them your check. That's what you want to do. If they say, I work all day and I can't go to the escrow company, does anybody know what we would do then? Courier. Is that something we pay for as agents? No. Who, who arranges that? The, the escrow company. Right? The escrow company will send somebody over in a car to pick up the check. They want the check too. Right? They want the check too. Right? Does everybody understand that you don't want the check? So I don't really care what you pick here as long as you don't end up holding a check for somebody. Right. Increased deposit, we haven't seen that. All cash, is all cash the same thing as no loan contingency? Same effect? And the answer is no, it's not the same. So this is a misconception. All cash is indicating that the buyer is intending to pay all cash. No loan contingency is where we admit the buyer is going to get a loan. But we're so confident that they're going to get the loan that we're not making that a contingency of the contract. If you were a seller, is there a difference between an all cash offer and a 
loan offer but no contingency. Is there a difference? Yeah, all cash is all cash. If there's a loan, even if it's not contingent, something could go wrong. They could lose their job. Lender's not going to make the loan. So it's not all cash does not mean no loan contingency. There's another box that says no loan contingency. Now, it's true if you select all cash. Notice how a lot of things went out. If you select all cash, then it doesn't talk about loan contingency, right? But if you leave it this way, it's going to allow you now to fill in the part of the loan. So, let, so does everybody understand all cash means they actually have the cash and they have to have written verification that they have those funds. Notice the default setting in uppercase is attached. So if you're making an all cash offer, they want to see that where's the cash? Where is it? All right. Then we're not going to do that this time. Now loans pop up and the question is how much should you put in here? Now, this was 928, was that the price? 928, let's say it's an 80% loan, so I take 928 times 0.80, 742, 400, 742, 400, and I hit tab, that's the amount of the loan. And it's by, for some reason, putting in, I don't know why it's doing that, but it put in what I've done before, I guess, which is 4% and a quarter of a point. Now, whether or not you put in something is, first of all, dependent on whether or not you're making the loan a contingency. If you're not making the loan a contingency, you can leave everything blank here other than the loan amount. If you're making the loan a contingency, then the question is, what loan is the contingency? And the answer is whatever you describe in this paragraph. So if you leave it blank, it could be interpreted that any loan you could possibly get, no matter what the interest rate, no matter if it's an adjustable, no matter what, you'd be obligated to do that in order to buy the house because you didn't specify what kind of financing you wanted, right? But if you're going to make a loan a contingency, you're going to want to say, I'm getting a 30-year fixed rate loan at no more than 4% interest with no more than a quarter of a point, right? And that means that if you can't find a loan like that, that uh, you don't have to buy the house. Does everybody understand if a loan is not a contingency, nobody cares what you write in here, right? If the loan is a contingency, then you should write something in. Where would you get this information? Who would have it? The loan agent. So you should be having a conversation with the loan agent. One of the people that I'm coaching, it's possible that their client is not going to be able to buy the house they wanted because they just they were late in the process of getting pre-approved and having it go to underwriting and they may not have a real pre-approval letter in time to write an offer and they're competing against an all cash offer that's not as high but you know eh, it's all cash right so does everybody understand you want to know this information from the loan agent before you're preferably showing people homes, right? Isn't that right? Before you're showing people homes, you would preferably like to know that they can be approved for a loan and how much and all that stuff. Now it's done the math, that's the additional down payment. Yeah. Bank statement, stock, uh, printout of stocks, or a letter. What I what I typically would do is the banker for my all cash buyers would write a letter, saying I'm the vice president of the branch of Bank of America, and I'm telling you this guy's got more than enough money to buy this house if he wanted to. All right, wow. easy, you know. No, not at this point. They just want to know. There, one of the things you're going to see, this is sort of in the dark arts area, of, um, is, is that there's a paragraph on the second page, paragraph K, that essentially says as long as you close, everything is okay. So what I'm not saying this is a good thing to do, or a, if there, I'm not encouraging people to do this. But uh, let's just say I've known people that have written offers where they checked all cash and they showed the cash. You have to have the cash. But they ended up getting a loan. Right? My all cash buyer 
never used his cash. He took a loan against property he already had and used that to fund, but he could prove he had the cash. Right. So basically, he, what people do is they say, look, I got the cash, I'm making an all-cash offer. But in reality, but, but, they're, but they're, in reality, they're going and getting a loan. And that paragraph, there's a paragraph coming up that essentially says that's okay, as long as you close. And that the seller is under no obligation to cooperate with you. Right? But in other words, like letting you have an appraisal, as an example if you didn't say you wanted one or had a loan. But anyhow, um, verification of down payment, it should be attached. If it, you, you're not clicking on the attached button, then it's a problem. Appraisal contingency and removal, is the appraisal contingency the same as the loan contingency? Are those the same thing? No, because the appraisal contingency is a separate one, and the default setting is that it is contingent. We're going to see more contingent on appraisal offers, right? I know I helped an agent this morning with an offer where there's multiple offers, but we're getting less of that, right? And when there's less multiple offers and prices are perceived to be falling, people don't want to bid high, and they might ask for appraisal. Um, whether or not you check that box, I would say is dependent on two things. One, how many offers is the listing agent expecting to get? And number two, how bad does the buyer want to buy this house? Right? That's the conversation. How bad do you want to buy this house? Right? You know, one of the agents I'm working with, the buyer's gotten really fed up with not getting the house, and we're now making non-contingent 150000 over asking price offers just because she wants it to end. How bad do you want to buy the house? Right. Isn't that right? Um, so 17 days, what you don't want to do is leave 17 days. That was written into calmer time, right? You don't need 17 days to get an appraisal done. You get an appraisal done in 10 easy. Right? So let's say if we're going to make appraisal a contingency, we would at least want to write in something like 10 days. Who would know how long it's going to take to get an appraisal done? The loan agent, right? The, per, the loan agent that you're talking to, part of the conversation is going to be how long is it going to take to get an appraisal done? Some loan agents would prefer to have the appraisal come in. Some loan agents would prefer to have the appraisal um, come in. Here, let me do this before the loan contingency is removed. Let me just... All right, I hope that's better. Um, in other words, because of the sequencing of the process, they would rather have the appraisal contingency come in and then the loan contingency be removed. Some lenders have said it doesn't really matter. They could be done on the same day. Sometimes the loan is contingent on it appraising whether or not the people are willing to put cash in or not. It's a conversation that you should have. Loan applications, you should have this box checked that says you have a letter attached. You should have a letter from a lender that says they can afford to buy a house. And the loan contingency days, um, again, the loan agent would be able to answer that. So you would have a, the conversation would be, all right, how long will it take you to have an appraisal done on the property and get it back and have it reviewed so we can make a decision? How long is it going to take you to get through underwriting so that we can remove the loan contingency? Tell me how long will it take, all right? And then also ask them how long will it take to close this transaction? So if we pick no loan contingency, what notice what happens. See how I've written in 10 days here? When I click on no loan contingency, it's still there. How about that? It was going away. I wonder if it does it over time. Let me just see what happens if I hit tab. Uh, anyhow, for the while it was, it was uh, whatever. So no loan contingency if there's no loan contingency. K is buyer stated financing. This is the paragraph that it says the seller is relying on what the buyer says on page one as to what their loan is, right? That's what it says. 
However, it implicitly is saying that as long as the buyer can close on time, there's no problem. It doesn't matter, right? That's what it says. It means that the buyer could have alternate financing. So they might show an 80% first and a 20% down, but in reality get a 80-10-10 or a 90% loan or a 95% loan. Right? They're not obligated. See, now, in terms of strate strategy, does a 80% loan look better in an offer than a 95? Yeah. Right? So if the person could qualify for an 80% loan, would we want the loan agent to write that up and say, as a matter of fact, they're pre-approved for an 80% loan on the, uh, up the, to this price, right? However, the buyer is saying, we really don't want to put all that money into it because we want to fix it up and we want to get a lower down. You'd say, you can do that, right? You could do that. We just have to close, right? We just have to be sure that you're going to get the 95%. Otherwise, you may have to go back to the 80. But if we're making an offer where it shows 80%, um, if it shows an 80% loan, 20% down, that's going to look better than a 95% loan. Isn't that true? And as long as we close, it doesn't matter. Cool. Um, other things, uh, we don't necessarily have to add all this stuff right now. One of the things Laura and I are going to go through is a revised list of advisories and addendums. There's a new wire fraud advisory out that ought to be included with all of your offers. Wire fraud advisory ought to be included with all of your offers. Did you know there's a wire fraud advisory that should be included? Wire fraud. And so what wire fraud is talking about is sometimes the buyer, um, either the real estate agent or the buyer's email system gets hacked. And so let's say you're the real estate agent and they've hacked your email and they find out that you have a client who's scheduled to put $157,000 into escrow by wire transfer. And the escrow is with Old Republic title. And your buyer ends up getting an email that looks like it's from Old Republic title saying revised wiring instructions. And it'll say, here's the link you want to wire your funds to. And it's got their logo and it's got the right everything because they've been reading your email and they know the name of the escrow officer and all that sort of stuff. And then the client sends $157,000 to some hacker's bank account and uh, is not happy. All right. And so the wire fraud advisory talks about how to avoid that. All right. Anything. So let's, how are we doing? Um, what else do I want to, so the, we're going to go through a list of all the different advisories that you might want. Sale of a buyer's property, talk to me if you need to do that. Seller shall pay for a natural hazard disclosures. Some people would put, including environmental seller's choice. What I do with this is I look and see what the listing agent already has. And does the listing agent have a natural hazard disclosure as part of the package? Let's say yes. Let's just say yes. If so, I'll leave it blank. Right. Is everybody with me? If they already have one, I'm not going to tell them that I want another one with environmental. Um, the next is government requirements and retrofit. The only box that I check here is the one for the seller that says they're going to pay for smoke alarms and carbon monoxide device insulation and water heater bracing. They're required in the transfer disclosure statement to say if they have it or not. The law, this is not a point of sale requirement. What that means is, is that this is not an obligation of the contract necessarily without the box being checked. This is not a, a part of, it's not a contingency of escrow closing. This is a requirement of property ownership. In other words, everybody that owns a house is supposed to have a carbon monoxide, smoke detectors, and their water heater is supposed to be braced right now. It's supposed to be, right, whether they sell it or not. So it seems um, reasonable that the seller should pay for it, since, but there's no law that says they have to. 
these others about cost of compliance, a minimum mandatory government inspections and reports, most of these are done in Southern California, most of the examples. There are some areas, like Santa Cruz has low flow toilets and low flow shower head requirements. By the way, everybody's going to have that starting in January, right? So in Santa Cruz, they have more arrangements. They have things that we don't require here, so you would need to find out about that and you would need to decide, you know, are there any, does anybody care um, who's going to pay for it? Who would know about whether or not, uh, one of the agents I worked with was East Palo Alto, wanted to know whether or not there was any of these things in East Palo Alto. Who would know that? That's right. A escrow officer that works East Palo Alto would know that. An escrow officer that works Palo Alto would know that, wouldn't they? Because they're seeing all the net sheets and things like that. You also could go to the Palo Alto website. You could Google search it and probably find out. But you could verify generally the escrow officers know about charges and things like this. Because anyhow, so um, that's 7B2. If you check seller's going to pay, it may frighten the listing agent and the seller because they're like, well, we don't know what you're talking about and we're, we don't want to be. So then if this is Santa Clara County, does anybody know what website I would send you to to find out who pays what? I, I always use Chicago Title Transfer Tax. Chicago Title Transfer Tax and dot com. And if you go to that website, it'll show you all the counties, all the counties, and who customarily pays what. And whether or not there's a city or county transfer tax. I'm going to leave that up for a second. All right. So, um, so Santa Clara County, it's seller's pay, seller's choice. Uh, if it's a place that has a city transfer tax, and where is this property that Julie has? In Santa it's in Santa Clara. Does Santa Clara have a city transfer tax? I don't think it does either. So if we go down to Santa Clara County and we look at who's got transfer taxes, it's Mountain View, Palo Alto, and San Jose. That's it. Not Santa Clara. So we don't want to check the boxes that say buyer and seller are going to pay when there isn't one. If I'm a listing agent and you send me an offer and it says we're going to split the city transfer tax 50-50 and I know there isn't one, I'm thinking you're not paying a lot of attention. Um, HOA fees and homeowner associations transfer fee is typically a seller pay Private transfer fees, I don't know of any in Santa Clara County. I don't know of any. Again, a title company might be able to tell you about those. Uh, other things you could check for people to pay for, who cares? Um, we're not going to, usually there's something wrong if you're writing stuff in there. Seller's going to pay. I still throw in a home warranty, yes. So the Sierra Club was doing this thing with the subdivision down in Southern California where they were opposing it. And they worked out an arrangement with the subdivider that if the subdivider charged a fee every time in the future a lot was sold and gave the money to the Sierra Club, they would no longer oppose his development. And he agreed. And so every time a subdivision is sold, a fee is paid to the Sierra Club. Well, that's, and people are paying for it. So I put in the seller shall pay, whether you pay or the buyer pays, I don't really care. But notice I have buyer's choice. So even if I'm asking the seller to pay, I want to be the one that orders the home warranty. I want to be the one that orders the home warranty. By the way, as a listing agent, I would put the home warranty on the property before I put it on the market. And then what I would do is I would, there was already the home warranty. It was already paid for, already chosen, but it, I was the one who did it. 
what the home warranty company is going to do is when your buyer moves in, they're going to start getting marketing pieces with my name on it as the listing agent. Do you want your clients to get marketing pieces with my name on it? Probably not. Right. So I know who did, well, how is it determined whether or not your name is on the marketing pieces or the listing agent's name is on the marketing piece? It has to do with who orders the home warranty. Right. So if at all possible, you can order the home warranty, that's better. And by the way, when I buy a home warranty for somebody, I generally get the platinum upgraded everything thrown in version. Right, because what you want is when something goes wrong. I had something go wrong with a relatively new house this month, um, and the home warranty covers it, and you've got all of the whistles and bells, and they're happy, and all the information still has my name on it. You understand this is good PR. What I wouldn't like is to have my name on the home warranty and it not cover something that they need to have fixed because I was too cheap to put in an extra $50 to cover those components, right? Do you understand? Why not just, if you're going to do it, just do it. I, I sometimes I pay for it. Sometimes I would pay for it to get my name on it. But if I could negotiate somebody else to pay for it, like the way this is written, the seller's paying, but it's the buyer's choice, which means me, right? Which means I'm going to be the one that places that. All right. Does that make sense? All right. Um, or you could waive the home warranty. I would, I don't know. Um, so you need, how do you know what's included in the sale? All right. We're going to do, we're, we're going to do this part and then next week we'll pick up on whatever page we're, we're left in. The, it's called Chicago title transfer tax, Sally, Chicago title transfer tax. If you just Google search Chicago title transfer tax, you'll find it. You could ask the Chicago title rep. Um, so items included. Notice it begins by saying basically that whatever the MLS says and whatever the flyers say doesn't matter anymore. Doesn't matter anymore. That's what it says. Is that what it says? It says we don't care what the MLS says and we don't care what the property flyer says. You ain't getting that stuff unless it's in the contract. So typically all stoves, are the refrigerators included or not? I don't know. Are washers and dryers included? I don't know. Now the reason refrigerators accept, you see that there's a refrigerator accept. Sometimes people have more than one refrigerator, right? They got the good refrigerator in the kitchen and then they got the junker that, that's out in the garage with the beer in it next to the dartboard and the, um, you know, the sports channel, right? Some, the, some people are relating to this, right? And so, um, and so, so does, does the buyer necessarily want the old refrigerator in the garage? Do you necessarily want to give it to them, right? Do you understand? So this would be something that you would want to be clear, like putting not included. Um, one of the suggestions for the following items is to simply write in all items mentioned in the MLS. Why not? Why not just write that in? Right? So we're arguing with the whether it's included or not. But this is something you need to have a good a conversation with the seller and the listing agent. So some examples, and one of my um, backyard garden, like, you know, there's landscaping, a little garden, and there's a concrete, painted green, concrete bench in the garden, a concrete bench in the garden, in the garden for sitting on while you're sitting in the garden. Is that included or excluded from the sale? Is it included or excluded? Let's see, existing electrical, mechanical, lighting, plumbing, and heating fixtures, ceiling fans, fireplace inserts, gas, logs, and grates. By the way, some agents think that everything that's attached is included, and if it's not attached, it isn't included. Are gas, logs, and grates attached to the house? No. Are they included? 
apparently. Yeah, apparently they're included. Uh, solar power systems, built-in appliances, window and door screens, awning shutters, window coverings, attached floor coverings, television antennas, satellite dishes, air coolers, conditioners, pool spa equipment, garage door openers, remote controls. They're not attached either, are they? But they're still part of the sale. Mailbox, in-ground landscaping. Trees, shrubs, water features, fountains, water softeners, water purifiers, security alarm systems. I don't see anything about benches in the backyard. I, I don't I don't see anything about that. Do you see anything that mentions? So what happened in this case was the buyer, of course, really liked it and the seller took it when they sold. Right. And then the, the buyer's sad. Do you want your buyer to be sad? What about item one? All of these pictures of fittings that are attached to the property. It's a, it's, it's a cement sitting there. You can you lift it up. Well, you could, I couldn't lift it up, but you could lift it up. All right, you can do it. What's number three? The following additional items you could, you'd write stuff in. Right. Right, you would. Right, the, the idea would be that anything, and, and by the way, the way you'll become more attuned to this is when you end up buying somebody a, a, a concrete, a concrete, a concrete bench for the backyard, right? After that, you're going to be pointing at things in the backyard and saying, is that included? Do you want that? Do you want it? And if they say, well, yeah, we want it, it, it it's for the backyard, then you're going to want to write it in. All right, you're going to want to write it in. Right. Um, but when you start to think about it, there's a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. Right. Also chandeliers. chandeliers are uh, lighting fixtures. So what I tell sellers is if they have like a Tiffany lamp or something like that, take it down now. Now. Put it in a box. Hide the box. Go to Home Depot. Buy one that you're willing to give away. And... Um, that's it. All right. So we've um, we've sort of what else is here? Leased or leaned items? Let me just say this: if there are solar panels on the property, you need to pay close attention. All right. There's a variety of issues. One, they may be leased or leaned. Leaned means there may be a loan against it. Leased may mean that they're leasing it. One of the weird things is that the credit score you need to buy a home is lower than the credit score you need to lease solar equipment. It takes a higher credit score to lease solar equipment than it does to buy a home. The reason is the solar equipment depreciates very quickly. You understand five-year-old solar equipment is really old solar equipment. So what happens is people will buy solar equipment thinking this is wonderful, then in three years they'll say, well, we don't like it, and we just don't want to pay for it anymore because it's an old, out-of-date solar system, right? So the credit score to rent lease a solar panel system is higher than to buy a house, and so you'll find people that can afford to buy a $928,000 house, but the solar company won't lease the equipment to them. Yeah, and it says here, um, buyer's ability to assume any such lease or willingness to accept the property subject to, to any such lien or encumbrance is a contingency in favor of the buyer and seller as specified in 14B and C. What 14B refers to is the time period that you have to remove the inspection contingency. So if you don't have an inspection contingency, I hope they don't have solar panels because you basically don't have that as a contingency anymore. All right, you understand if you put zero days in 14, which you shouldn't do, you should just click on the remove, the contingency removal, we'll talk about that, and check the ones that you're willing to remove. So 
Well, if, you, if you're everything to buy and you see solar panels, you want to get that information as soon as possible about them. It's also possible that they bought the solar panels using something called a PACE loan, P-A-C-E loan. A PACE loan has super, what's the right word? Um, it, it's a first loan and it overrides, it comes before first loans. In other words, to say it plainly, in order for the buyer to get a loan to buy this house, if it had a, a, a PACE loan for solar panels, those solar panels have to be paid off before the buyer's loan will fund. In other words, it can't be paid off during escrow out of the seller's proceeds. It has to be paid off by the seller before the lender will fund, which means that they may have to write a check to pay off the PACE loan in order to free the lien so that the property can actually be sold. So if you represent a seller and they have, and you see solar panels, you need to really figure out how did they get there? Did you buy them? Are they leased? Are there, is there a loan on them? Is it a PACE loan? Do you have a copy of it? Can I look at it? Right? Because if it is, it, it's a totally different arrangement. Why don't we talk if you have one of these? Right? Does that seem like a good idea? Right? If you find one, talk to me. Talk to me. All right, uh, items excluding uh, from sale, brackets. Um, this is one thing, I, some people click on this, some, some people have found this. Wall, uh, TVs are attached to the house, but you don't get them. So they take the TV, right? It says you don't get the TV, right? The, you, but what about the brackets? What about the brackets? So some people leave the brackets and some people take the brackets. Right? The brackets are pricey. So brackets, what is the default setting? Attach the walls, floors, or ceilings for any such component shall remain on the property. Is it possible your buyer doesn't want the brackets? So you would check that box. Will be removed and holes or other damage will be repaired but not painted. Or they leave the brackets and you remove them. Or buy a TV that fits. I don't know. All right, so that was part one. We're going to next week. We're going to, my, my goal is to get through this in a, a quicker fashion so that you know how to fill it out. And then we're going to talk about practicing how to get somebody to fill it out after we have filled one out. All right? So you mentioned the other day that some of these ones have changed. Slightly, not the RPA. They've added the wire fraud advisory. They've made modifications to the um, the entity representation. I'm not saying it right, but what, if you're if you're representing a, um, a a corporation, an LLC, a trust, the representative capacity form, they've made some minor changes. Most of you wouldn't have recognized the difference if you saw it, but when we go through that, I'll explain at least what we're doing now. Not now, not the RPA. You can tell, by the way, because there's a revision date, and this one is 12, 2015.